why didn't I get my slides up while we're uh, while we're waiting? Oh, it looks like you need to let me share my screen or whoever the host is. Yeah. Gabe, do you is Sabina here? Yeah. Uh, can you do you have access now? Yeah, it looks like you should. Try. Yeah. Okay, let me try. Yeah, I do now. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Kate, let me know if you if I or let just wait, Richard. Just yeah. Great. So. Does that look good? Do you see the? Yeah. The, just the slides. Yeah. Okay. Yes, perfect. Okay. So, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for spending your lunch time with us by joining today's Bragg Research Series with Professor Richard Allen from Berkeley's Seismological Lab. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, a uh, big welcome to all of you. So, what do we do in Bragg? Bragg's mission is to provide a forum for collegial interaction in the research administration community. And we achieve that by facilitating presentations by subject matter experts, creating an environment for peer-to-peer -peer exchanges and seeking and sharing best practices. As I uh, said earlier, today is part of Bragg's research series in which uh, we invite faculty to pre present uh, on their research and that gives us an opportunity to connect our administrative work to the technical work that are being completed by the faculty and the labs that we support. So without a further ado, I will request Kate Lewis to welcome and introduce our today speaker, Professor Richard Allen. Over to you, Kate. Thank you. I'm super happy to have you here, Richard, uh, Professor Allen. Um, we started probably around the same time at Berkeley, I think, maybe a little That's bit right. before me. Um, <laughs> and so Richard is one of the first PIs that I got to support, which is very exciting. Um, okay, so Professor Richard Allen is the director of the Berkeley Seismological Lab, the class of 1954 endowed professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science, <clears throat> and also a member of the earthquake team at Google, which is very exciting. I see that on the slide. Um, he is an expert in early earthquake warning systems and deep earth imaging. He has led a number of methodologies to detect, to detect earthquakes and issue warnings um, prior to shaking, which is very important, um, using seismic and GPS seismic networks, and now also smartphone networks. And I'm sure you're going to talk about that today, I hope. Um, his group developed the earthquake, earthquake early warning algorithms that generate alerts in the US, which is called the Shake Alert System, in Israel and in South Africa. And they also built the MyShake smartphone seismic network that delivers alerts in the US and detects earthquakes through the globe. Today, Professor Allen will describe how the BSL developed the idea of an earthquake early warning system and built the consortium needed to develop that science, engineering, and public policy that led to the public alert system we have today. So without further ado, actually, I've got one more question. How do you prefer to receive questions? Sure, at any time. Is okay, that, should, that should we put them in the chat and then we can just pop if, okay, can just To be it. honest, I mean, to be honest, I prefer if people just call them out. That okay. would, I'm happy to take questions at any time. In fact, I prefer to do that. And I, uh, I would much rather if people just want to unmute themselves and ask the question, that would be just fine. And um, it's difficult to monitor chat while you're you're talking. So I will be monitoring chat for you. So I'm happy Great. to also. So if everybody's welcome to unmute yourself and ask questions directly. And if you don't want to, you can also send me a private message or you can put something in the chat and then I can, um, I can ask those for you. So without further ado, <laughs> I present you Professor Allen. <laughs> it's so funny what having Kate called me Professor Allen. Obviously, we worked together very closely for a long time. <laughs> anyway, it, it's great. Thank you, Kate. And let me just say, yeah, Kate, as she said herself, um, she she used to be a member of the Berkeley Seismology Lab. And so um, it's great. I, I can never refuse a request from Kate. So when Kate reached out and asked if I could do this, I was more than happy to do it anyway. But uh, Kate was a great, valuable member of the BSL for many years. And so anyway, I just wanted to acknowledge that, Kate. So thank you for the invitation. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk, yes, as Kate said, about earthquake early warning. I kind of wanted to give a flavor of the growth of earthquake early warning, and there's many stages to this, as, as Kate alluded to, and as you can see with these different names, um, it's probably, I don't know, one of them you've probably heard of at least, which is Android, but the other ones are the Sh Shake Alert is the early warning system, My Shake is the app that we created here at Berkeley, um, and then Android is sort of the global growth, and I'm going to sort of walk through all of those. Um, also, obviously, this is a gathering of the folks who support the research at Berkeley, and, and you know, I really feel like this project, this effort that I'm going to talk about, I, I refer to it as being kind of the product of Team Berkeley, because it's not just about what the Berkeley Seismology Lab did, it's obviously, it's about what the Berkeley Seismology Lab was done, facilitated by so many different groups across campus, that obviously includes you folks um, in research administration, but it also includes the government relations folks. And it includes the public affairs folks. And for me, one of the real pleasures of being at Berkeley is that obviously I get to do the research that I really enjoy doing, but it's that Team Berkeley aspect that really is exciting and enjoyable. And so that was why I was also more than happy to come and talk about this to this group. Okay, so without further ado, let's let's jump in. Before I talk about earthquake early warning specifically, I wanted to just um, say a few, I have two slides about the Berkeley Seismology Lab for a little bit of context. Um, the Seismo Lab is, um, it's an organized research unit. It's actually the oldest organized research unit on campus. We don't believe it should continue to be an organized research unit because it's the oldest one, it's because it does the most important work as far as we're concerned. <laughs> but we're also proud of the fact that uh, it has a very long history. So the first seismograph in the Western Hemisphere was actually at Berkeley, okay? In 1887, the first seismograph was uh, deployed in the Western Hemisphere. We actually had two of them. One of them was on Observatory Hill, which is very close to the North Gate of campus, right outside the present day McCone Hall, which is where the Seismo Lab is located. And the other one was on Mount Hamilton. Um, then kind of working through history, you know, in 1906, the Lawson report, that was the report after the 1906 earthquake. And that was really the beginnings of modern day earthquake seismology. Professor Lawson, who chaired that, was at Berkeley. Um, 1959, the Worldwide Standardized Seismic Network. That was the first worldwide network um, to detect uh, seismic events. It was actually deployed to detect nuclear tests and to monitor nuclear testing. And one of those first stations is actually in the Berkeley Hills, right up um, above campus in this tunnel that goes into the hillside. 1991 um, was the Berkeley Digital Seismic Network. I just love that name. The fact that digital is in the name is because it was so you know, new to use digital data rather than analog data. And then today, as you're going to hear about today, you know, we're now trying to push far beyond the number of instruments that uh, that we had previously by using smartphones. And and as you will hear, Android is now part is now a global seismic network consisting of about three billion seismometers. And so I'll tell you the story of how we got to that point. So that's kind of that's where we come from. Um, you know, we, we're very focused, obviously we're a group of scientists, but we're very focused on our societal mission as well. So sound science serving society. Our mission has four pieces to it. Um, the first is fundamental research, not surprisingly, and that's not just looking at earthquake processes, but that's also looking at earth structure, imaging the processes, plate tectonic processes that drive the plates that cause the earthquakes. So fundamental research, Hazard information, obviously, it's not just earthquake early warning, it's things like shake maps, magnitudes. Okay, most important fact for everybody to take away today. It's next time we have an earthquake in the Bay Area and you hear on the news, oh, you know, we had, a ma we had an earthquake today. It was a magnitude five earthquake beneath San Jose. The USGS reports a magnitude five earthquake between San Jose. Actually, that magnitude comes from Berkeley. So Berkeley's network monitors the earthquakes, the USGS as well, they're a synergistic effort, but it's Berkeley's network that provides the magnitude for all of the earthquakes that we talk about because it's our broadband network that it has the capabilities to really determine the moment magnitude. So when you hear it's USGS reports a magnitude, blah, 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 actually it's Berkeley, don't forget that. <laughs> Okay, and so we. this is our hazard information piece. Um, obviously, we're very engaged in education, obviously uh, in classes, but also beyond that, whether it be public education, 
and conferences and, and the media, basically talking directly to the media as part of our sort of public outreach effort. And then of course, finally, professional operation. We, we, have a, we have a fantastic staff at the Berkeley Seismic Lab, really fantastic staff. And it's very important to us that we support those staff. We give them um, you know, uh, um, uh, mobility within their careers. And, and so professional operation is important both for our staff, but also to have reliable um, earthquake products. So those two things go together. So what makes the BSL unique is the fact that we have all four of these elements and it's the synergy between these elements that I think is our secret source. The USGS, for example, runs seismic networks, but they don't have the education piece um, that, that we have. So it's the fact that we have all of these pieces in one place, we run a seismic network, we do research um, with the data, we educate people about the value of this. That's what I think um, is, a, is our secret source at the BSL. Okay, so let's talk about earthquakes and earthquake early warning. Um, let me let me just pause. I could actually just pause if anybody wants to ask a question, give people a chance in in class mode. <laughs> okay, so let's keep going. So let's talk about earthquake early warning. Um, and where I'm gonna get to is the Android system, which means we're now doing global earthquake early warning. But I wanna go through the steps of ShakeAlert. So first of all, ShakeAlert, that's the system that uses our traditional seismic network to detect earthquakes. So ShakeAlert records the earthquake, detects the earthquakes and generates the kernel of an alert, if you like. MyShake is then the smartphone app. If you don't have MyShake on your phone, shame on you, it is free. It is Berkeley and you'll get a warning before an earthquake. What more do you need to know? So get out your phone and download the MyShake app. It's free from the, either the Android store or the, um, the Apple store. Download MyShake onto your phone and that way you'll get warnings. Um, and, but we also use the MyShake app to actually detect earthquakes and to record seismic waveforms from around the world. And then Android obviously is the push to do this globally by partnering with Google. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. So that's the, that's the, um, the roadmap. Uh, Richard, I have a quick question. Yeah. Does the MyShake app need to be running in the background all the time or can it be kind of shut down? Yeah, no, no, no. So, so you just download the MyShake app um, and the, your, you do have to open it the first time. So you download it, you open the app and that registers your phone into the system. Um, and then once you have that, you're, you're all set. You don't, it's not like you have to have MyShake in the foreground, for example. And if you shut down uh, MyShake, you will still get the alerts. Um, but if you shut down the app, then, then you won't, if you leave it running in the background, then the app will also detect earthquakes and provide waveforms for us. And I'll tell you about that in a minute, but it doesn't affect so shutting down the app doesn't affect receiving the alerts. That's right. Okay, great question. Okay, so um, so let's so right. So first of all, shake alert. So where did shake alert come from? The idea of earthquake early warning. How did it happen? So I like to think of it as there's two parts to the shake alert story, two sides to the shake alert story. The first side is the public story, and and that's where Team Berkeley comes in. I mean we. To make this happen, to, to create the concept, or well, having created the concept, to turn it into a public alerting system took work that's got nothing to do with seismology. And thanks to Team Berkeley, we were, we were able to do that. So this is that public story. So it really started in April of 2011. Um, that was when we had the magnitude nine earthquake in Japan, the Tohokuoki earthquake, as it was called in Japan, caused a huge tsunami, you probably remember it. Um, and they had an early warning system. And we saw that as an opportunity. We, at that point, we'd been doing some of the research with early warning, but that was an opportunity to be more public about it and advocate for the idea we should build a public warning system. So with the support of our Dean at the time, Mark Richards, we convened a meeting, a summit at Berkeley, as you can see from the picture, um, uh, of all of the researchers involved in this, representatives from the private sector, legislators who were interested in earthquake early warning to really talk about what we were doing and make the case that we should start to build a public warning system. And ShakeAlert is a direct outcome of that meeting at Berkeley back in 2011. Um, then in 2016, uh, we got an invitation from the White House to participate in a White House summit about earthquake early warning. Same sort of setup, they brought in legislators. We actually had, I think it was about five representatives and two senators come and speak at this, at this workshop. 
Um, and ironically, at this point, we, we Sheikh Alert was already existed, but the states weren't really contributing. So ironically, it's a White House summit and the direct outcome of the White House summit was the state of California started funding earthquake early warning. So that was, that was a big success. The other outcome was that this summit, um, the Moore Foundation actually offered to start funding MyShake. So the MyShake app really got started at this, out of this White House um, summit, thanks to funding from the Moore Foundation. And then in October of uh, 2019, um, we started issuing public alerts in California, and that was launched by the governor, as you can see here, and, we and that was delivering shake alert messages to my shake phones. That was the public alerting that started um, in California. And then about a year later, Android got into the business and they started delivering the alerts in California and started their work toward the global system at, at large. So that's the timeline. I'm a seismologist, right? I was, I was trained as a seismologist. It's sort of amazing when you get involved in these projects, you end up getting sucked into all kinds of things far beyond what you ever expected, this, this being an example of that. So that's the public story that uh, you know, some people have heard about, little pieces of, that's the public story. But the, oh, and this is just to say, this is a very large scale collaboration. So Berkeley has been playing a, a key leading role, I'm very proud to say, but this is a partnership with Caltech, with University of Oregon, University of Washington, the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, they provided two chunks of funding, six and a half million dollars, and then another, I think it was $3 million, USGS, um, California Office of Emergency Services, and now Google. So a broad, broad collaboration, the people all pulling in the same direction, which is what made this work. So that's the public uh, story. Yeah, can go we, ahead. Can we uh, ask a quick question? So there's a question about the app. So um, my shake is Berkeley's app, and I believe that's the state of California app. There's other apps as well, like my earthquake alert. Um, do, do we need to, there's one called my earthquakes alert, I think my earthquake alerts. And then there's another one called quake feed or my quake or quakes. Should those other ones be downloaded as well or? No. Okay. So, so the, the, the answer is, so yes, my shake is the Berkeley app. Um, my shake is also the official California warning app. It's funded by California Office of Emergency Services. Um, there are a lot of other apps when you search, and this is one of the challenges we have when you search um, on, you know, in an app store for earthquakes, there are lots of apps that tell you they provide earthquake alerts. What they're actually doing is they're providing you notifications of earthquakes detected using the regular system. So you get those notifications or alerts as they call them minutes after the earthquake. So that of course is completely different. The whole point of my shake is you get the alert before the shaking. So this is one of the real challenges we have is that it's it's very difficult for people to understand the difference between those two. But of course, there's not much we can do about how other apps list themselves in the app store, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so that was the public story. But the other story, which is kind of what we care about equally, um, is the whole point of seismic networks is that we use them for dual use purposes. So all of our seismic or geophysical networks, we use them both to uh, provide hazard information and reduce hazards. And we also use them as a source of data for scientific research. So the Berkeley network, the traditional network, as I call it now, was always built for both hazard reduction and for research. The same is true of the phone-based networks. So, so the value here is that by having earthquake early warning, we justify having a much denser seismic network. Um, and this is that network. This is what that network on the West Coast, this isn't just Berkeley's network now, this is the, in, the aggregate networks um, on the West Coast. Um, and this, this um, shows how that um, um, group of stations, hopefully you can see the video running, um, this shows how those stations have basically been expanding over the course of the last year. And all of these stations are funded by having earthquake early warning. Um, but of course, all of these stations provide data that can be used for research. So it's that dual use that's really important. Um, right now, this is a little bit out of date. We're up to about, I think, 1,200 stations. Um, and we're, where we're going to is about almost 1,700 stations as part of the shape, the shape alert system. Did that video play? Can I just make sure that video played for you? Yes, okay, good. Okay, so what is earthquake early warning? So how does earthquake early warning work? 
Um, this is an animation, it's obviously a cartoon, but it's sort of running in real time of what a real earthquake would look like. This animation was actually made by one of our undergrads who took my introductory earthquakes class, got very excited, and then he made this animation and we've used it, I don't know, thousands of times. It shows a magnitude eight earthquake. It started at the northern end of the San Andreas Fault. That thick brown line is the earthquake rupture coming down the fault towards San Francisco. The yellow circles are the P waves. That's the first seismic wave that comes radiates out. It travels the fastest um, and it's the first energy that we would feel. So here in Berkeley right now, boom, we would feel the P wave. This is a big earthquake. So we, it would be a good shake and we would know that we were feeling an earthquake, but that's just the beginning of the earthquake. This is by no means the strongest shaking. And we would think that this was just maybe a moderate earthquake, maybe a magnitude five earthquake that's in the Bay Area, we would have no idea what's coming. It's not the real shaking doesn't really start until the S wave arrive and that's shown by the red circles. So the S waves arrive in Berkeley right about now. And the S wave is the stronger shaking. It travels at about half the speed of the P wave. And so now things really would be shaking. So this is when damage would really start in a big earthquake like this in Berkeley. But still, this isn't the strongest period of shaking. The strongest period of shaking is when the rupture itself, that wide brown line that still hasn't reached point rays, it's not until that wide brown line comes to the section of the fault that is closest to us. So the section of the fault that's immediately west of San Francisco. When that portion of the fault ruptures, that's when we would see the strongest shaking and that's when most of the damage would be. That's still another 30 seconds or so from now. Again, this is running in real time. So this is just to illustrate that there are there can be a lot of time between when an earthquake starts and when the really serious ground shaking actually occurs. And so the idea of earthquake early warning is we use our seismic network. So, so right about now is when the strongest shaking would start at Berkeley. So that's more than a minute, about a minute and a half after the earthquake started. So the idea of earthquake early warning is we use the seismic network close to the epicenter. So in this case, up at the Northern end of California to detect the earthquake. And then we send out an alert ahead um, of the ground shaking. So that's the concept behind earthquake early warning. I yeah, have okay. a question. Um, so for a typical earthquake, is it really gonna be rupturing the, down the whole fault line? Or is it more of a, like, it's going to be in one spot and then the waves, like, how okay. does that actually work? Sure. So this is, this is the most damaging earthquake for the Bay Area because A, it's the large magnitude earthquake, largest magnitude earthquake, magnitude eight, that's the largest we expect on the San Andreas Fault. And secondly, it's, it's prop, it starts in the north and it propagates down towards us. So you get a directivity effect. It's like the Doppler effect when a car drives by you as it's coming towards you, you hear one pitch as it's driving away from you, you hear another pitch. So the fact that the rupture is coming towards us and it's the largest magnitude, that means it's the most damaging earthquake for, for the Bay Area. But this is also magnitude eight. And so the fact that it's a magnitude eight means that it ruptures this very long section of the fault. A magnitude seven earthquake will rupture a shorter section. So for example, the magnitude seven on the Haywood Fault will rupture basically the length of the Bay Area. So yes, you could have a magnitude seven on just a portion of this fault, that's true. And so, so that, that's a shorter section of, 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 of rupture. And so the bottom line is that for the largest magnitude earthquakes, we can potentially have the most warning time. As the magnitude gets smaller, then you're only affected if you're closer to the epicenter and you also have less warning time. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, do you have an estimate and uh, estimate time in terms of like when you get that first initial um, warning, um, how much time do people have to, and I know you mentioned this being in real time, but how much people have time to get under a desk or go right. out and uh, wherever right. you're supposed to be. Yeah. So, so yes, we could, maybe we can, as... <laughs> sorry, say the last bit again. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm jumping, you know, ahead. To, it's uh, okay. That's, that's uh, fine. No problem. So, so yes, we can, just as I just did, like you said, as I just did in this animation, we, we seismologists can estimate how much time until the strong shaking is going to reach any individual, any location during it, when we send out an alert, but we actually don't, provide a countdown. We don't provide an estimate of how much warning um, you're getting. 
And the reason for that is that social scientists have shown that if you give, if you, so basically what we want is we want to send out the alert. The alert says drop, cover, hold on, and you just do it. That's it. And what social science has shown is if we start to provide other pieces, and so the message says, you know, earthquake detected, expect shaking, drop, cover, hold on. Um, and social science has shown that if we provide other information, such as a countdown, then people sit there looking at it, watching the countdown. So, so we don't do that. And that's, that's, there's a lot of debate about that. Would it be better to provide people with a warning, a countdown of the warning um, or not? Right now, we don't for that reason. Um, the other issue is that we might, you know, the accuracy of that countdown may not be perfect. And so we may be giving, you know, may not be the best information to provide to people, basically. And, and just a really quick follow up, you know, I'm assuming with earthquakes, um, it's not um, the same as like example flooding where you're evacuating, like because it happened so suddenly or whatever, there's a different type of response and it's not that. Yeah. evacuation response okay that's exactly right so actually let's talk about that that's really important for us all to to be very familiar with so when it comes to an earthquake in a big earthquake which is not what any of us have experienced here in the bay area in the last decade in a really big earthquake nobody's walking or running anywhere the shaking is so strong if you try and stand up you will fall down and you will injure yourself so the recommendation of what to do when there's an earthquake, whether you get a warning or whether you just feel shaking, is you drop, cover, and hold on. So the drop is so that you don't fall over. That's the most important thing is to just get on the floor. Because if you don't get on the floor in a big earthquake, you're probably going to fall over and a very large number of people injure themselves in the process. So you drop. The cover piece is to get under a sturdy table. I'm, I'm sat at a desk here. So get under a sturdy table. And that's so that things don't fall on you, right? We were very fortunate in California. Most of our buildings um, are designed to a level where they shouldn't collapse. But the, the, um, the stuff in them is likely to come off the walls, ceiling tiles, lighting fixtures, bookcases, and falls on people. Um, and so that's why you get under a sturdy desk if you can. Um, and then the hold on is just so that the desk doesn't bounce away from you. So that's what you should be doing. So nobody's, nobody's evacuating. I mean, in a big earthquake, you would not be able to evacuate. It won't be a choice. Um, and so, so yeah, so that's why the, the message is very straightforward. Drop, cover, hold on, whether you feel shaking or whether you get a warning. Thank you. All right, great. Okay, so that's the concept behind early warning. That's why it's possible to provide people with a few seconds. Um, and this is um, this is why I suddenly realize, I'm not sure I shared my sound. Now I'm gonna start playing this. If you can't hear the sound, can you let me know, Kate? Um, so this is, this is an example of why we need earthquake early warning. This is a video that comes um, from Mexico City, obviously. Do you hear the sound? I cannot hear the oh. sound. Okay. It's important you do. Let me just, I'm going to, what I'm going to do, I, I just have to stop sharing and then reshare and then I think I will be good. I didn't click the share sound button when I shared. Okay. I managed to share that? Yes. Okay. You see the same screen again? All right. So hopefully, so this is this is from Mexico City. Um, and this is why we need earthquake early warning. Do you hear the sound now? Great. So the siren you hear in the background is actually the earthquake early warning system in Mexico City. And that's why people are outside because they've got the warning. So this is this is one obvious example of the value of earthquake early warning. So Mexico City, they built the one, it was the first public early warning system. As you can see, they set it up with speakers. So they actually have a siren that goes off across the city. Everybody can hear it. 
And so people, in that case, people do get out of buildings, it's different. And the reason that people get out of buildings is that there's a lot of very dangerous buildings, like obviously the one you just saw collapse. And, and so these, and the, these buildings, um, it, they, they collapse as a result of the low frequency energy that comes later. So that actually provides even more warning time for people to get out of the buildings um, and obviously not, not be in that building when it actually collapses. So this is just a, one very obvious example of why earthquake code warning is, is valuable. Yeah, Kate. Uh, question on that. Um, is there any talk of using the California emergency system like if there is a really big earthquake to broadcast, the, what is it called? The California. Do you mean the WEA, the WEA system, the the one the that emergency phones, broadcast the Amber alerts? No, yeah, the like, emergency broadcasting system, the one that actually puts out sirens outside. So you know, like the first Wednesday of every month at noon, they do the test of the emergency broadcast system. Okay. Is there any so, talk of using something like that? Yeah. So that is a Berkeley thing, right? Not a California thing. So the the speaker system. Oh no! It's oh, it's everywhere. Okay. So yeah, it's everywhere. Okay. So yeah. So I so I guess the answer is no. I'm not, I'm not aware of any discussion of using that, but that's definitely something that that could be considered. I, I think it has been considered at various times. I, I'm not really sure what why nothing's happened on that front, but I but nothing has happened on that front so far. Yeah. Okay. So that's the idea. So that was the sort of the background of early warning. And so, you know, when we created MyShake, we created MyShake as a citizen science project. But the idea that MyShake, there was this sort of recognition that, yes, we run a seismic network in Northern California, but if we can actually harness the accelerometers in phones, then we could potentially do this anywhere around the globe. And so that was how we kind of got to the point of starting to explore phones um, to, to do early warning. And as you know, I've already said it several times, Android has now taken that on um, from us. Okay, so I don't think, oh, I, this is sort of, you know, why early warning? I mean, this is, the, this is the justification actually that finally led to the congressional funding for earthquake early warning was, it's why early warning? It's about reducing these falling hazards that I was just talking about in answer to one of the questions. In the Loma Prieta earthquake, more than 50% of injuries were due to falls. And in the Northridge earthquake, more than 50% of injuries were due to non-structural, as in falling hazards, the kind of stuff you can see in this picture of, a, of an office building falling on people. So the argument is very straightforward. If everybody gets a few seconds of warning, if everybody drops, takes cover and holds on, then we could reduce the number of injuries by of order 50%. I mean, that's a huge impact. If we can in reduce the number of injuries in an earthquake by 50%, that is a fantastic outcome. We had to make a cost benefit argument. Well, the cost of injuries, just the injuries in Northridge is estimated to be between two and $3 billion. So if we can save half of that, then earthquake early warning has paid for itself many, many times over. Um, just some photos just to you know we we all have a tendency when we think of earthquakes to think of like for example the magnitude 5 earthquake we had in san jose in october of last year these sort of small magnitude earthquakes that come as a jolt it's not a big deal and we should remember that the earthquakes that we're concerned about are magnitude 7 earthquakes on the haywood fault and this is what a big box store is going to look like after an earthquake like that um, here's an example from i think this was from yes from the airport terminal um, in Santiago, uh, Chile has fantastic building codes, just as good as ours, um, but this is what happened in one of the airport terminals. Japan, spectacular building codes, but here's what happened to a concert hall um, in the Tohokuoki earthquake, basically the entire ceiling um, fell on, on the hall. It wasn't occupied at the time, fortunately. But this is why, this is why we need earthquake early warning. Can you talk at all about the, the Turkey and the Syria? Uh, earthquake, uh, and I guess there was a recent one um, as as well. I don't know if it was in Lebanon or um, somewhere, but I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe that's wrong. In Morocco, there was one in Morocco. Maybe Morocco, that's what you're thinking right, of, right? right. Yeah. So yeah, I can let me, me. I mean, I don't actually have any slides on that, but I'm happy to talk about those earthquakes. Maybe we can do that at the end. Okay. Um, yeah. 
And then the other piece is automated control, taking the warnings and using them to automatically do things. Bart trains is the spectacular example. All Bart trains automatically slow and stop when there's an earthquake based on the early warning system that we have. Very straightforward. But within industry, isolating hazardous machinery, chemicals, data security, and then situation awareness for emergency response and power utilities, things like that. These are the automated kinds of actions that people, uh, people like to use. Okay. So let's talk about the early warning system we have today. It's called ShakeAlert, um, and, and it's now functional in California, Oregon, and Washington, but it took us a long time. I mean, I, I showed you the first slide in that public part was, um, was in 2011. You can see we started working on this in 2006, basically when I came to, to Berkeley, when Kate was at the Berkeley Science Lab as well, when we started to design and develop the concept of earthquake early warning. Um, lots of operationalization, live demos, things like that. But what really matters, of course, is the public alerts. And that started in October of 2019 in California, and then we extended into Oregon and Washington in 2021. I, I like to just sort of pause and include, you know, again, Team, team Berkeley. In this case, I'm talking about just the folks at the Berkeley Seismo Lab. Um, you know, there's this real kind of synergy of the science and outreach piece the software and IT, the field engineers. Again, I, I've already said this, but I'm gonna just keep saying it. One of the great things about Berkeley is the way we can bring together people from with all of these different skill sets to actually make big projects like this. And of course, the entire early warning effort is built on the research that our students did. I mean, it was our students that did the research um, that came up with the concept of earthquake early warning that we since have, um, have implemented. Okay, so what is what is the warning look like? What do you actually get? So shake alert issues public alerts whenever we estimate the magnitude is greater than a four and a half earthquake, and we send the alert to wherever the shaking intensity is three or greater. And so this was one of the first public alerts that we issued. So we launched in October, 2019. This is one of the first public alerts um, in Los Angeles. It was a magnitude 4.5 earthquake. Um, and gives you a sense of, you know, this is the area that we might alert. So you can see that this particular earthquake was pretty much beneath downtown Los Angeles. Um, the shaking intensity three region, this MMI, modified McKelly intensity, shaking intensity three, that's this contour here. And so you can see that we basically, for this event, would alert all of the Los Angeles, the greater Los Angeles region, including all the, you know, the San Fernando Valley, et cetera, and all the way over, over here as well. Um, so a very large, um, alert area. So this was a really great test for the system. Again, this was one of the first public alerts that we had. Um, it's a very challenging event. It's right at the lower limit, right? It's a magnitude 4.5. So what that means is that there's a very small alerting area. This will be the smallest area we will ever alert um, using shape alerts. Um, but of course, there's a very large population to warn, about 12 million people affected by, by this particular earthquake. Um, this is, these are the waveforms that feed into this system. I wanna give you a sense for just how little data the system has available to it before it sends out an alert to 12 million people in this particular case. So these are the seismograms um, plotted as a function of distance. So distance from the epicenter of the earthquake. Um, and so the first alert that was issued for this particular earthquake was issued at this time, about four and a half seconds after the origin time of the earthquake. And we immediately estimated the earthquake magnitude to be 4.5, spot on. And so based on that magnitude, the first alert gets sent out to a distance of about 32 kilometers. Okay, so we actually would have alerted out to 32 kilometers out to about here. So that first alert was ahead of the, even the P wave, never mind about the S wave. Remember the S wave is when the, the strongest shaking starts is when the S wave arrives. That alert then got updated, um, magnitude 4.6. Um, it actually increased the magnitude adjustment with the fourth alert up to magnitude 4.7. Um, and the fifth alert got up, to, it was the largest magnitude estimate we had, which was a 4.8, which means we sent the alert out to 54 kilometers. So as far as earthquake early warning goes, this is, you know, spot on. So obviously the earthquake was magnitude 4.5. If we're within half a magnitude unit of the true magnitude with the alert, then we are really happy um, with that outcome. But this is just to emphasize that that first alert uses these tiny, tiny snippets. There's actually one additional seismogram that's not plotted here. That's why this is here. But we are just using these little snippets of the waveform 
to detect the earthquake, locate the earthquake, estimate the magnitude of the earthquake. I mean, it's really cool that we can get this much information out of so little data so quickly. Um, and so how do we do that? We use an algorithm that's called EPIC. It's an algorithm that we developed here at Berkeley. Um, Angie Chung um, is, is one of the primary developers along with um, Ivan Henson is, is one of the, Angie is a seismologist, Ivan is a developer. Um, and so the two of them have been at the forefront of developing this algorithm. It processes this data in these tiny 0.1 second chunks of data. We use just four seismic stations to issue that, that first alert. Um, and this algorithm, it's not the only algorithm that's part of ShakeAlert, but it basically, this algorithm provides all of the first alerts. We designed it to be the fastest algorithm to get the alerts out as quickly as possible. The research continues with this algorithm. Um, we, uh, we have a postdoc working on improving various aspects of it and several developers. And we're now using, just to give you a sense of where this goes, we're now using machine learning to improve this. So using machine learning classifiers to recognize the, the P wave and the S wave and try and squeeze out just a little bit um, more warning time. So how are we doing though? So we've now, that was the launch was uh, October, 2019. We've got a, a more than three years worth of, of performance under our belt. So how good is the system? So over that three and a half year period, we've actually had 89, true alerts, as in correct alerts, um, distributed it. The system is California, Oregon, and Washington. You can see the vast majority of the earthquakes happen in California. Um, so the 89 uh, good results. We had three false alerts, okay? Now all three of these false alerts, they were actually all real earthquakes, um, but the locations were very poor. And so they, we class, if they have a location that's more than a hundred kilometers away from the true location, we classify it as being um, a, a false alert. And so these two, um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but these two um, in the um, offshore, they were actually closer to being onshore. So, you know, they were real earthquakes. This one um, uh, in uh, central California actually was located at the California Oregon border. And so there were, at, this, at the time that happened, there were very few seismic stations at the California Nevada border. And that's why we mislocated it. So three false alerts, but all we understand them at least. They're not a surprise. And there were eight missed alerts and they were all from the edge of the network. So again, the same thing. These are all small earthquakes at the low end of the scale. Um, and they're all at the edge of the network, which is why we missed them. So we're basically, we're very happy. We have essentially 90 good events. Um, we, we have the three false alerts are more concerning. We're actually less worried about that now because we've improved the system. And the missed alerts were all small magnitude earthquakes. So we're actually really happy with the overall performance of the system. Um, Richard, there's a couple of questions. Um, yeah. One, does I see that the, one of the missed alerts and some of the other alerts are down in Baja. Um, mm -hmm. How far south does the alert system go? Okay, so this white box that you can see on these maps, that is the ShakeAlert um, uh, detection region. So we, we it's, a, it's a little strange because ShakeAlert is not allowed to issue any alerts south of the California-Mexico border, but the detection system is designed to detect earthquakes as far south as that white box that you can see. So you can see all of those events down there. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so there's this sort of blurry area. The re this region is included in the system because obviously if we have an earthquake that occurs just south of the border, we may need to alert people north of the border. But the system is a US system and therefore it doesn't issue alerts south of the border. That makes sense. So even, yeah, even if a, like a US person has that app on their phone and they're in Tijuana, then they wouldn't get a, an alert like they would in San Diego. Correct. Okay. <laughs> Funny That's story. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Funny story. The the you know my shake, which is how we deliver the alerts. Um, we the the there's a complicated process by which my shake knows where the phones are located, and so we've had a, a situation where there was one earthquake, um, one of these earthquakes that you can see on this map south of the border, um, and my shake actually sent an alert to a total of five phones that were south of the border. And you, the US Geologic Survey got super upset about it because it was issuing an alert to five phones that were south of the border. So yeah, it's it's taken very seriously. It's an issue of sovereignty almost um, for these groups, unfortunately. Well, we need to get a treaty in place then. Right. Um, so the second question, 
Um, we're all very lucky to have smartphones. Is the app limited to relying on having an active cell service? Thinking of rural communities that may not have access to cell service or Wi-Fi, et cetera. Is there a way in which these rural communities can use the app or be alerted without a cell phone? Yeah, that's a great question. No, this is an issue. Um, the So I am not going to talk about that at all. There are other strategies. Um, so like the equivalent of a NOAA weather radio, as in using the same system, which is basically a, a radio frequency based system, is something that has been explored um, to send out to send out the alerts in these kinds of communities. Um, I believe that there is a more significant effort to make that happen in Oregon because this is a real problem in the eastern portion of Oregon that there's a there's a significant fraction of the population in the eastern portion of Oregon do not have access to either cell phone or Wi-Fi. And so there's a there's a an effort to do that. So yeah, so that's been recognized and it's recognized as a problem um, and that something should be should be done about it. Um, but the, the, but the, the, uh, yeah, I don't know exactly what the status of those pieces is. The, you know, this honest answer is that here we have been very focused on getting as uh, alerts to as many people as possible as you're about to hear. The whole reason we started doing this with MyShake was because nobody was getting the alerts. And so as a result of that, you know, the sort of first step to get to as many people as possible as quickly as possible was to take the smartphone approach. And so that's the approach we took. Okay. Great segue. So those are the alerts. So this this is showing I, this is showing you shake alert is detecting the earthquakes. It's creating the information, the kernel of the alert. Okay, that's what shake alert is doing. So the story story so far, part one of the three parts. How are we doing for time? Um, okay. Oh boy. Okay. So part one is shake alert is sending the alerts. Okay. So rapid earthquake characterization we know can provide seconds to tens of seconds of warning. Um, there's a wide range of uses, personal protection, um, and so we're generating alerts, but at this point, nobody was receiving them. This was a real problem. So ShakeAlert was ready to start generating alerts, but there was nobody, no way to deliver them to the public. And so we decided to step in with MyShake. At that point, the MyShake app existed, but it, was, it existed as a, um, uh, as a, a Citizen Science app, app to record earthquakes. So we decided to step in and use MyShake to actually start delivering the alerts because nobody else was doing it. Nobody was getting the alerts. It was a bit of a problem. Today, uh, we are making a big leap forward in terms of focusing attention on prevention. Uh, we are announcing the nation's uh, first comprehensive early alert system for earthquakes. We're announcing the ability for millions and millions of Californians to download an app, MyShake. Download the app, MyShake. Millions of people do that. We will have points of contact, the ability to crowdsource information, the likes of which no country in the world has advanced. I say that knowingly, that Japan and Mexico have systems already in place in this space. But because of the extraordinary uh, complementary work that was done by UC Berkeley, by Caltech, by USGS, uh, and by our own Office of Emergency Service, we feel we are on the leading and cutting edge in terms of the ability to utilize this technology. But it is only as good as you. You download that app, we now have another point of contact, and we are now all part of this remarkable capacity to iterate, to experiment, to advance science in real time, to make us all more safe. And so I just cannot impress upon folks more the importance of going to the App Store, whatever their device may be, downloading MyShake uh, and reading the instructions and encouraging friends and family to do the same. This is about 10 seconds. It's about 15 seconds. This could be as much as 20 seconds of early warning. So obviously we were delighted Then the governor decided he would announce the launch of the app. We'd obviously been working towards launching MyShake to deliver the alerts for a long time. We only learned that the governor was going to do it at 8 p.m. the previous evening. We were also told, I was told at 8 p.m., sorry, slide aside, at 8 p.m. the previous evening that the governor had decided he didn't like the name of the app and he wanted us to change it. 
quite how that was supposed to happen between 8 p.m. one evening and the next morning. I have no idea. So you wouldn't have noticed. But when he said the word my shake, I smiled in this video because that was the first time I realized that, oh, we're not going to have to change the name of the app. We've decided to just launch it with the with the name that it has. Of course, the app was in the store, etc. So, yeah, interesting experience working with um, the governor's team on this this announcement. But bottom line is it came through. It was a, a big splash in the media and it led to, you know, huge number of downloads of the MyShake app so that people would start, start getting the alerts. Um, so what the app does is it delivers the warnings to people. Most importantly, that's why most people will download the app. It also provides damage information. So after an earthquake, you can go and you can click on this button, share your experience, and you can say whether the shaking was strong and whether there was damage, things like that. Um, and then you can see this crowdsource map of damage. So why is this important? If we had a, a big earthquake and you're at work um, and you're wondering, you know, you're about to go home, you would want to know where the damage was. And so the whole point of this is that you'll be able to see where the damage is. So that's the second piece that um, we think is very important for, for the app. But uh, of course, you only realize it's important when you really need it. It has preparedness and safety tips, of course. Um, it also provides a map of earthquakes around the world, things like that. So that's the purpose of my shake. Yeah, Kate. Two questions. Um, is anyone researching how to predict earthquakes rather than detect them, or is that impossible? Great question. I would. The short answer is it's impossible. So most seismologists would agree that we're not going to be able to predict earthquakes in the foreseeable future. Um, and the reason for that is that earthquakes are a cascading failure on a fault plane. It's kind of like if you um, have a pile of sand, if you have a sort of constant stream of sand grains making a little pile of sand on the desk. And if you watch how the sand avalanches down the sides, that's a critical failure process. Sometimes a grain of sand will just cause one other grain of sand to move. Sometimes it creates an entire avalanche. That's what happens with earthquakes, with little bits of the fault popping off every single day. And then one day it just grows and grows and grows and you have a big earthquake. And so that's why most seismologists would agree that we can't predict the earthquake itself. But as soon as that earthquake starts, we can predict the ground shaking. And that's the idea behind early warning. And also, you know, the 30% chance it's going to happen or 80% chance it's going to happen in the next number of years. I love the fact that you know the numbers. I don't know if that was you, Kate, or the person asking the questions, but it's fantastic that somebody knows the numbers. That's exactly right. So it's a 30% chance of a damaging earthquake on the Haywood Fault, which goes across our campus through the stadium, right? 30% chance of a magnitude 6.7 or larger earthquake in the next 30 years. It's a two, it's a it's about a 70% chance, not 80%, but it's about a 70% chance of a large damaging earthquake in the Bay Area as a whole in the next 30 years. Sorry, I cut you off. You didn't actually ask the question. Oh no, I was just responding to the first thing. The second question, oh. um, in terms of this detailed damage information, is there also uh, the ability to put in like secondary damage like fires or you know, right. that kind of stuff? Right. So there isn't. Um, I mean, that would be a great sort of uh, way of expanding the app, to be honest. We've actually had people talk about you should use this to deliver warnings of fires, wildfire type things and things like that. It's, it's the exact same back end. You know, we have the system to deliver it. We would just need to know where where to send the alert to, right, for wildfires, for example. So that hasn't happened. I sort of have mixed feelings about it, um, about these additional add-ons. Um, you know, we're, we're a seismology lab, we understand earthquakes, and I think that's why we've been able to create this whole concept that now, you know, Google has adopted. And so, I don't know, it's, it's a tough call to decide at what point do we stop, whether we would include these other things. It's a little bit different fire following an earthquake versus wildfire, but but that that's one of the concerns. Okay, thank you. Um, and if you have a few extra minutes, we can, whoever can stay on can stay on, um, and then people can exit too, if you don't have a hard yeah. spot. Yeah, no, no, it's, I don't have a hard stop, so I'm happy to, but I, I so I think what I should do um, is, so I sort of introduced my shake um, as a concept. I'm going to, I just, I want to just introduce, um, get, at least get to the point where I, I can show you um, Android, what Android is, and then I'll stop and I can answer questions and I'm happy to stay a little longer. This is an example of the warning times that we get. This is for what's the largest earthquake we've issued in the for so far, magnitude 6.4 Ferndale earthquake. And this is the amount of warning time. Um, and you can see that people got warnings, people down here in the Bay Area got warnings of over 100 seconds. 
So this is just so people realize, you know, in a small earthquake, you may get a few seconds. In a larger earthquake, you could have a minute's worth of warning. So that's the kind of warning time that, that you can expect um, when you actually get, um, get the alert. Okay, so I'm gonna just very quickly, I'm gonna skip ahead here. Let me just do it over here. And I just wanna introduce that, you know, so what's really, I'm equally excited about the fact that we created this concept with a traditional network. We developed the concept um, using smartphones, and now we've transferred that technology to Android and they've turned it into a much larger um, global system. So let me just show you what that looks like. Sorry, if I get my slides. Um, I get that one. Here we go. All right. So, so you know, so the story here is Shake Alert is creating the alerts. My Shake, we use My Shake to send the alerts in California, Oregon, and Washington, and we also use My Shake to detect earthquakes, which I haven't really talked about. But we use My Shake to figure out how we can detect earthquakes using the accelerometers on the phones as well. And so, you know, now now that we know that this is possible, now we've created this technology. The bottom line is that we really wanted to see this scale. And at one point we would talk about, well, maybe MyShake can become a global earthquake early warning app, um, but then Android got interested. Um, and so we were more than happy to start working with Android. You've heard the myth that animals seem to know when an earthquake is coming. Like there's some universal warning system the animal kingdom all subscribes to, telling them when to head for open ground. But people, we just keep doing what we do, hanging out under gaudy chandeliers or lounging under shelves of geology books in a library, completely oblivious, until we're right in the middle of it. Uh -oh. So Android worked with leading seismologists to create earthquake alerts. As soon as a tremor is detected, an alert gets sent out to your Android device, giving you precious seconds to find cover or safer ground. After the quake, your phone sends feedback to help us learn more about quakes so we're even more prepared for the next one. Too bad animals don't actually get alerts, because now you can. Earthquake Alerts, now part of Android. So, pretty cool, huh? It's nice when you have like a major PR group ready to actually advertise the concept of earthquake early warning. So Android got interested in this, and so Ching Kai, who was a graduate student at the Seismo Lab, and myself, um, started to work with them on what is now the global Android earthquake alert system. We started doing this back in 2019, um, and so what they do is um, they now detect earthquakes globally. Um, and, and the reason that we, we wanted to partner with Android is that basically 70% of smartphones globally are Android devices. So if you wanna pick one platform and put earthquake early warning on one platform and have the largest global impact, Android is the way to do it. And so that's why we started these conversations with them um, and, and have been involved with them ever since. This shows an example of an earthquake being detected by Android devices across Los Angeles. Um, basically, the, the, the every single Android device automatically becomes part of this earthquake detection network at this point. Um, and so, so the system is able to detect on a very large scale. So I'm gonna go sort of quickly just to give you a flavor and then I'm gonna stop. So they now issue alerts. They use the same thresholds that we designed for Shake Alert. So they issue alerts when an earthquake is estimated to be greater than a magnitude 4.5. Um, they send a be aware alert, if, if what they call a be aware alert when the shaking is weak or light. And they send a take action alert, which takes over your phone. And it doesn't matter if it's in do not disturb, takes over your phone and gives you this message to drop cover and hold on if you're going to experience um, stronger shaking. And the obviously the power of this is just the rapid growth of earthquake early warning access globally that this has provided. So this is this is earthquake early warning system growth around the world. The Mexico City that I mentioned earlier, Mexico City system was the first public early warning system. They started in 1991. So this has years on the horizontal axis and the millions of people with access to earthquake early warning. So that's the Mexico City for uh, Mexico City system that was turned on in 1991 in blue. Then Japan turned on their system in 2007, a national uh, national system. A couple more systems were added, national systems, the system in Taiwan and the system in South Korea. The system in South Korea actually uses the algorithm we created at Berkeley, the EPIC algorithm, to issue public alerts in South Korea. Um, and then, of course, the US system got turned on in 2019, as I was just describing. Um, and so at this point, 250 million people have access to earthquake early warning globally. 
And then the Android system starts to issue alerts based on their own detections and, and starts to roll that out. So we get to 400 million people um, who started to have the alerts with the initial rollout. Slight pause or, or tangent, Israel started a national system, again using the Berkeley algorithms for their national system um, in the first quarter of last year. That's called the Truer system. Um, so we'd actually share the code that we have with many countries around the world. There's testing going on in various places. Um, and then the Android system continued its, its, uh, its global rollout, um, essentially, to the point where it's up over 1.4 billion people now have access to early warning um, thanks to the Android system. And in fact, I can tell you that as of about four hours ago, India now has earthquake early warning. The uh, early warning system was turned on in India earlier today. There was a big public announcement about it um, in India. A lot of government, that's what I was doing this morning, a lot of government officials doing a demonstration of getting under a desk. It was pretty interesting to watch, I can tell you. Um, and so that, that we're up to now, I think it's 90, it says 93 countries. I think we're now up to um, 97 countries that are getting these alerts um, globally from Android. Okay, so I'm gonna stop um, and uh, I have some slides here talking about um, how people see the early warning as, as useful. People get really excited. One of my best, most favorite quotes was, um, was one person saying, it's like being a prophet. You get this warning on your phone and you know that shaking's gonna happen and then the shaking starts. So it's been very well received. So just to wrap things up, and then I'm happy to take questions. So Shake Alert is detecting earthquakes and it's generating alerts in California, Oregon, and Washington. It's doing very well. I mean, it's, it's generated large alerts um, we have very few problems. We've had very few complaints about um, anything, any aspect of the system. It's actually been very well received, much better than we thought it would, to be honest. And so from a science side, that's pretty cool because thinking about the science, you know, we develop these models of what earthquakes look like. And so we get to test them every single day. So we have this hypothesis of how to detect earthquakes and characterize earthquakes. We test them every day by sending out alerts to millions of people. Um, which is pretty interesting um, a way of testing your science. So now, so MyShake and now Android, are of course, delivering these alerts and detecting earthquakes around the globe. Um, and the other piece here, again, is sort of dual use network that I've not really talked about here, but there's now this massive source of data. Three billion devices are collecting seismic waveform data that we could potentially use for research purposes. There's, there's issues of privacy, just to state that. We can talk about that if people are interested. But, but the, you know, the, the potential for future research building on this data that we're now collecting, thanks to the fact that we're providing hazard information, is really phenomenal. And so that piece is probably one of the things um, that I'm most, I'm most excited about. Okay, I, I realize I am over time. I was hoping to finish a few minutes early. Let me pause there and I'm happy to take any questions and stay as long as people want. Any questions? I don't see any in the chat, just a lot of thank you and appreciations. Um, I can wrap up and then I actually have a question, well, an offer um, of, Industry Alliance's office. Um, so let's give a round of applause for Professor Allen. Uh, thank you everyone for taking the time out of your busy schedule to attend today's BRAG meeting. We will be putting, well, I already put the link, I'm gonna put it in again to the short survey um, in the chat. Please take a minute to provide feedback on today's meeting and also to help make recommendations on future topics. Um, we will also be sending out the email or the survey in an email. Our next BRAG meeting will be November 1st. Um, We'll send out details soon, but I believe we're going to be looking at a post-award panel similar to how we did a pre-award panel um, a couple uh, last month. Um, so thank you everyone. And Richard, uh, for the data that the Android system is collecting, does that all come to Berkeley? And is Berkeley owning that data or is Android company owning the data? And then we potentially would get to use it if they let us use it. Yeah, very great question. So no, so there are very so so now I'm I'm part of Google. I'm part of the Google team that does this. So let me just say that first. So the data cannot leave Google for a very simple reason of privacy. It would be a violation of of you know the privacy Google's privacy policy with its um, uh, its users 
to for the data to leave Google. So that's a you know that it's it's taken. I know it sort of sounds, but Google takes privacy incredibly seriously, and you know the the fact that none of this data can come out um, of Google is is um, sacrosanct, I guess. So no, so the answer is that this data doesn't belong, absolutely doesn't belong to Berkeley and it can't even come to Berkeley. So that's one of the challenges, right? Is that, so there's this fantastic data set, but the only way to use it will be to do it internally within Google. And so that brings about with it all kinds of challenges um, in terms of, of, of making that possible, making that feasible. And so I want to acknowledge those challenges, but that doesn't mean it's not worth it because the thing, you know, what we could learn if we figure out how to do that um, is, is just phenomenal. And so, so that's something that, that we should bear in mind. But remember, my shake is also collecting data globally. It doesn't have any, it doesn't have, there are no, there are no 3 billion <laughs> my shake downloads, unfortunately, but my shake does collect a large amount of waveform data as well. And so at the Seismo Lab, we are using the MyShake data to explore earthquake processes. And, and what's really interesting about it is, of course, that the phones, you know, we, we put out traditional seismic stations in quiet locations, locations where um, there isn't cultural noise. But the phones, they're where we are. So, you know, when we go to bed at night and we put the phone um, on a dresser or whatever, and then it feels the shaking or records the shaking during an earthquake, we actually have a recording of the same shaking that we experience in an earthquake, which is pretty unique. And so we're using the MyShake data to start to better understand what people experience in earthquakes. As an example, the shaking that we have in our homes is about a factor of three greater than the shaking that we record in the traditional seismic sites. And that's because the buildings themselves are amplifying the ground shaking. So I think there's a great deal that we can learn by looking at that, at that waveform data. So I've got a follow-up question. I think I already know the answer to it, but I think it's useful for everyone else on the call still and for our recording. So our phones are moving all the time. You know, we're on BART, it's rumbling, we're in the car driving, we just have it in our pocket walking. How do you differentiate between an earthquake and regular movement? Right. So there's two parts to that. The first part is that we only go into monitoring mode when the phone is stationary. So the phone has to be stationary, like you put it down on a desk or, or, or whatever it might be for a period of time, and then it goes into monitoring mode. And then when it moves, we have an algorithm, a, a neural network based algorithm, a machine learning trained algorithm that looks at the waveform and it decides if it looks like an earthquake or if it looks like all of the other motions that you just described. Um, and we found that algorithm has about a 93% success rate of recognizing earthquake versus non-earthquake. And so if the phone, is, I'm talking about MyShake, and if so, if the MyShake phone thinks thinks that it looks like an earthquake, that's when it sends the trigger message to our backend servers. And that's when it records the seismic waveform, which it then uploads to the server at a later time when your phone's connected to Wi-Fi. Um, are there other questions? Um, I guess I just have one more. Is there any uh, opportunity or I guess opportunity to work with Apple to have the same kind of Android network for iPhones. It would make sense, right? <laughs> so I don't know. Apple is a very um, uh, uh, there's no transparency. I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't, I'm going to stop making comments. I, I I don't know the answer to that. It would be great, okay. wouldn't it? It would be great if earthquake early warning was available to everybody on all platforms everywhere in the world. I, and, and you could use computers and iPads and things like that as well using the same kind of iOS. That's right. So MyShake is actually, MyShake right now is just on phones, but MyShake is expanding to desktop computers um, for exactly that reason, um, so that we can both increase the number of ways that you can receive the alert, but also increase, a, so to potentially provide other avenues to detect earthquakes. Um, and if you were to, part, or if, my Shake or Shake Alert was to partner with Apple. Would it be USGS that's kind of the licensor of the data, or would it be something that Berkeley would want to do, or Berkeley would initiate or facilitate? Yeah, no, no. So, so to get access to Shake Alert alerts, then any entity, including My Shake, and so including Apple, if they wanted to, if they wanted access to the Shake Alert alerts, they would have to sign a licensing agreement with USGS. No, it's got nothing, that would have nothing to do with us. That's right. 
Okay. So the, so a p- potential partnership with Apple would be on the USGS side, not necessarily the Berkeley side. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause they're the official source of the deal notes. Awesome. Well, if there's no other questions, then we can thank you for your time again. Um, sure. It's always good to see you. And yeah, I, likewise, I find this all very interesting. I think, uh, it's going to sound really weird, but you know, the Seismo lab being my first job at Berkeley and just, I feel like the staff and faculty were amazing and everyone was kind of all in. And I remember when there were earthquakes, we'd all run to the conference room and, and look at the, you know, <laughs> that's it's true. Just... It's still true. Even in the virtual world, it's true. It is. I mean, I, I said it at the beginning, you know, we're so fortunate. I mean, one of the best things about being at Berkeley, as far as I'm concerned, is that collaboration across everybody students, faculty, staff, everybody. And that it's uh, true at so many scales, and it, but it's also true in the Seismo Lab. We have, um, it, we have a great group of staff in the Seismo Lab that make these things work. And so, yeah, what you're describing is still the case, I'm very pleased to say. You're welcome back anytime, Kate, or anybody else for that matter. <laughs> well, um, we had talked at some point about doing lab tours. This is pre-pandemic. Huh. Okay. So in addition to doing research talks, the idea of having a smaller group of research administrators going to visit labs, seeing some of the equipment and hearing, you know, a, a much briefer presentation, but but hearing sure. about about the science that's being done um, and how sure. the RAs are supporting it. So that that's a future state. Um, we don't have any plans to restart those yet, but that could be something that we let me make you let me make you an offer so first of all of course you're welcome to bring a group like that to the Berkeley Seismic Lab but what we could also do is take that same group up to the Biley Vault which is that vault I mentioned it was built as part of the first global seismic network and it's a shaft you must have been up there at some point Kate it's a shaft that goes horizontally into the hillside up Mm -hmm. above the botanical the Berkeley Botanical Gardens it's where we have our instrumentation it's where we do a lot of testing of our instrumentation it's pretty interesting facility um for 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 obvious reasons it's in the hillside so be happy to take a group um for example up there that'd be great and I remember also you I went on a tour early on um with one of your undergraduate classes where you took kind of a walking tour and we saw the stadium before it was redone, but we also saw areas where the asphalt was slipping down the street, where we saw right. the creek was displaced. I mean, that would be so, pretty. So very quickly for everybody else, I, I still teach that class. I, we have uh, 700 students in that class this semester. It's the earthquakes in your backyard. And we take the entire class in groups of 50 on that field trip that you're talking about, where we walk along the Haywood Fault, basically from Founders Rock on Gailey Road, Foothill Dormitory and then into the stadium. And it is absolutely the highlight of the class for the students. It's a huge amount of effort, as you can imagine, the logistics of 700 students, but it is so valuable for everybody to actually see. You can see how the current new stadium is now offset relative to how it was built just what, 10 years or so ago. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, absolutely. That would be, um, that's a fun trip, but it's another thing that we could do. I'd be happy to do that as well. Yeah. Um, if you have dates for the spring semester, or I don't know if it's a fall or a spring class, but I'd be happy to share that out with our group too. Sure. Well, the the trips are happening right now. I actually did that oh. last weekend. <laughs> oh, well then if you have but, dates and times, then then I can also share that out. Sure. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you again. And I hope you have All right. the rest of your day. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Bye.